Hello everyone, hola, buenos días. Estábamos haciendo todo el ajuste para la interpretación. Y esta es la primera vez que estamos haciendo un evento con interpretación y nos tocó aprender sobre todo la logística. Uh, hi everyone, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, we are sorry for the delay, but we are doing for first time and a dialogue uh, with interpretation. So we were learning and adjusting uh, for this. Um, for, eh, para las personas que, que hablan en español, eh, les queremos eh, recordar eh, poner sus micrófonos en silencio y por favor ahí la interpretación para cuando se vaya a hablar en inglés y lo importante es que puedan seleccionar siempre un canal para que puedan escuchar a los intérpretes. Y si escuchan dos voces, por favor, seleccionen un canal. Uh, so most of the conversation today is going to be in Spanish with Darío Mejía. So we really I advise you, uh, if you don't speak Spanish, to choose a, a channel. Uh, you can find a globe where you can choose a channel. And, and please, if you hear two voices, uh, just disactivate it and, and choose a one so there is an icon on the bottom of the of the zoom uh, thank you thank you so much and again i apologize for the delay Dario, we will appreciate if you uh, turn on your camera so people can can see you and um, Dario, are you there Dario? <laughs> Dario went away. <laughs> he's now in Mexico and I think he's having some connecting issues. But anyway, we're going to start. Uh, we are going to wait for Dario. And eh, muy buenos días, muy buenas tardes y muy buenas noches. Eh, bienvenidos y bienvenidas al quinto diálogo sobre territorios de los pueblos indígenas. Eh, mi nombre es Luisa Castañeda y soy una de las co coordinadoras eh, de, de esta sesión y esta iniciativa sobre diálogos. Es un, es un honor contar con ustedes y sabemos que es, muchas personas se están conectando de diferentes partes eh, del mundo. Eh, los invitamos a que puedan conecta, eh, presentarse, introducir eh, sus nombres en el chat y de dónde se están conectando y de qué organizaciones, de dónde, qué pueblos. Sería eh, muy, eh, pues muy interesante poder saber de dónde, de dónde las personas se, se están conectando. Eh, nuestro invitado de hoy, Darío, pues me ha escrito, estaba teniendo algunas fallas, pero él está conectándose de nuevo. Eh, es Darío eh, Mejía eh, Montalvo. Pero antes de, de conectar eh, con Darío, yo quisiera eh, hacer un reconocimiento en el territorio en que nos encontramos. Eh, por, eh, por general, el reconocimiento de este territorio pues, sirve para recordar que a todos que la Universidad de Maguil y más ampliamente la ciudad de Montreal, de donde estamos haciendo este eh, diálogo, se encuentra en territorios indígenas no cedidos. Eh, la nación es Anishabé, Kanekenaka, eh, han sido reconocidas durante mucho tiempo como custodios de estas tierras y de estas aguas. Pero sin embargo, en el contexto pues, virtual en el, en el que nos estamos conectando, pues hay personas que no solamente están eh, desde la isla de la Tortuga, sino también en muchos otros territorios, por lo cual es muy importante que podamos pues, reconocer y, y respetar estos vínculos de, de los pueblos indígenas con este territorio. Eh, mientras Darío se conecta, me gustaría pues hacer una introducción eh, de él. Eh, Darío es, eh, pertenece al pueblo indígena Senú de San Andrés de Sotavento y Darío es colombiano como yo y actualmente es el presidente del Foro Permanente sobre Cuestiones Indígenas de la ONU. Él es politólogo de la Universidad Nacional de Colombia con maestría en gestión de desarrollo conferida por la Universidad de las Regiones Autónomas de la Costa Caribe Nicaragüense. Eh, él es líder de la Organización Nacional Indígena de Colombia, ONIC, y pues a lo largo de muchos años de su carrera como activista y como líder indígena, pues ha desempeñado diferentes 
eh, posiciones. Particularmente en el 2004, eh, da, 2014, perdón, Darío coordinó la terminación del, 19, del decreto 1953 en el componente indígena del Plan Nacional de Desarrollo y también apoyó el procedimiento del Fast Track en el marco del acuerdo final eh, de paz de Colombia. Eh, Quisemos empezar, pero Darío no está... Ah, sí, Darío está conectado. Darío, ¿puedes poner tu cámara? Y abrir tu micrófono, por favor. <ríe> tu micrófono está apagado. Oh, buenos días, me tocó cambiarme de lugar. Disculpe. Bueno, pero tienes un, un fondo mucho más, más bonito. Darío, muchas gracias por conectarte. Eh, sabemos pues que... Que, bueno, ya después de eso estás en, en unos compromisos, pero gracias por, por sacar el tiempo. Ya como habíamos conectado, eh, conectado habíamos hecho una eh, presentación de, tu, de quién eras tú y, y la posición que actualmente ostentas y todo el trabajo que has venido realizando. Eh, y pues, pues tenemos personas conectándose de, de muchas partes, pues lo cual lo hace mucho más interesante este diálogo. Si bien este diálogo es sobre la región de América Latina y lo que planteamos discutir hoy son como esos desafíos y complejidades que, que se viven en la región. Eh, obviamente es inevitable en tu rol como presidente del Foro Permanente a veces no abordar ciertos temas desde lo, lo global para aterrizarlos a, a, lo, a lo regional, ¿verdad? Eh, pero, pero para iniciar, Darío, eh, yo quisiera hacerte una pregunta más más personal y es porque quisiera saber que, que pudieras contar que nos pudieras contar más de ti y es sobre tu identidad y quisiera comentar eh, comenzar con, con una pregunta más más tuya y es en qué momento en, en tu vida empezaste como a reconocer o a entender o a identificarte como como una persona indígena como un indígena senú y, y que, cuáles fueron esos retos que viste en tu comunidad que luego fueron como esos detonantes que te llevaron a convertirte pues, para trabajar por la defensa de los derechos de los pueblos indígenas. Muchas gracias, Luisa. Eh, un saludo muy especial a toda la audiencia, a nuestros invitados, invitadas a, en las eh, redes. Esta ha sido una enseñanza un poco más próxima de la pandemia, eh, pero que nos ayuda en este momento a, a comunicarnos, a veces en doble sentido, en doble vía, a veces no tanto. Eh, yo, yo estoy ahora en, en un lugar, eh, en la ciudad de Mérida, y, y tuve que salir de aquí para tener mejor conectividad. Yo lamento mucho si hay algún tipo de ruido de fondo que no, no ayude en la comunicación, um, pero es por estas dificultades. Y en relación con, con su pregunta, um, parece fácil al principio y parece coloquial el, el, el hacerse, el entenderse indígena, uh, pero, pero no lo es porque a muchos no, nos ha correspondido el, la pregunta de quiénes somos, de quién soy, eh, por, por situaciones traumáticas que suceden a nuestro, a nuestro alrededor. Uh, en nuestra infancia eh, eh, no entender por qué había que esconderse o no entender por qué el papá tenía que irse en las madrugadas y a, a, a recuperar las tierras de los resguardo, del resguardo. No, no entendía uno esto, que, ¿qué significa recuperar tierras? ¿Quién la había robado? ¿Por qué había que recuperar? ¿Por qué? Ese tipo de preguntas de niños. So those kinds of questions that you ask yourself as a child, that's not very easy to answer because as a child, you just want to be with your parents, with your mom and your dad. You want to have them close. Uh, 
Well, obviously, every upbringing is different, but this was the principal um, thing that caused me my concern. What does it mean to recover land or to recover territories? And my childhood was really um, centered on these kinds of issues and the places, the places where I live, my community is called Fleitas and the biggest community is called Tuchil. A Cuchin was something that was talked about regularly because in Cuchin they captured so-and-so in Cuchin, they killed they this person. In Cuchin, this happened or that happened. And I was able to understand those things, but maybe it wasn't until I got to the university why Cuchin was such a place that was so important for those who weren't so in such a good condition. And it was a place of a meeting place. It was the leader for the leaders of that municipality. They had to go through that place. They were obligated to go through there. And it also, because it was a requirement to go through there, it later, it became like a point of weakness. And I understood this later on when I started to do my thesis or my graduate degree at the universe, National University. But as a child, we don't, you don't ask yourself, am I indigenous or not? Rather, what you ask yourself, why are certain things happening? And then later on, in, when I was in high school, I was able to under, meet, other, meet other people. We got involved in the youth activity. Then we started to have workshops and training sessions. I say with the, with the older people. Well, with the you know with the training, the training that we got about the protecting the Senu people. And we start to understand these things. But as a child, we um, don't understand these things. But then we start to accept the identity. Some of the very difficult questions. We are now, there's also a fascination. There are certain things that we are waiting for. We know that there are people that go through there, that go through there that are patrolling the area, but we say that the violence continues. And when we, I wasn't really able to understand the complexities of the political violence, it was fearful, but also curiosity to know what was going on. Who are they? Who are we? Because we also have to say that at that time, we had to, we were going through very difficult times. It doesn't work like that. I'm sorry, his connectivity. Um, there was a violent situation going on in our area. It was a difficult situation. So we had to continue to work as such. I'm sorry, his connectivity is frozen. Uh, he's cut out. Uh, sorry, we lost his connectivity. I know he's having some connectivity problems, but 
I've been working for a year with him, and this is the first time that I've been able to listen to that part of his story. And I know that he had the desire to defend the rights of his people. And now we see him as having this more important, this role, global role as the chair of the permanent forum. Uh, we're, I know we're talking about you, but we would like to now go on to this, this global issue and have, understand your perspective of what's going on now and what's happening in the region. What are the what are indigenous peoples facing in general in the region? Yes, here I am. Okay, go ahead. Darío, you have had the opportunity to participate in different scenarios. That opportunity So uh, you are you are being like so many uh, scenarios where you can donde tú has donde has estado mirando las diferentes realidades. You've seen so many different scenarios in different regions throughout the world. To, uh, and so I'd like to know, based on those experiences, what are the challenges that indigenous peoples are being are facing at the global level? And how do you see these challenges are reflected in the Latin American region? We'd like to hear the different realities based on these experiences. So I think I'm going to keep my camera off. I think that you can hear me better this way. And um, the first thing uh, that I want to say is that with the special mechanism is that with the permanent forum of the UN on indigenous issues, the very name of itself reflects the problem and the issues that indigenous peoples are facing because the debate whether there existed a special mechanism at the UN or not that was in charge of discussing with is, with indigenous issues. It took three years for them to establish this kind of mechanism, and actually it was even more. Because the UN was not um, did not have this mechanism, and it wasn't until after world wars that they were able to establish a world order according to their inner interests. And that's why after World War I, indigenous peoples went in and they tried to get the UN to listen to them and participate in the discussion. But because they've always had it very clear that the states do not represent indigenous peoples. Because really the states is a figure that have imposed their their barriers, their borders, that they've been imposed on the indigenous territories and the forms of government that indigenous peoples have always had in their territories and in their lands. And the second thing that indigenous peoples have always had clear, very clear throughout the world is that in spite of the imposition of legal um, boundaries or legal configurations due to the political interests. In, indigenous peoples have never disappeared. Therefore, indigenous peoples have the right to express their voice independently and autonomously in every place around the world. So this clarity is what led the Maori people 
1924 to try to dialogue with the United Kingdom in order to have their voice listened to. But this year, in 2023, it will be the commemoration of 100 years of having of the first indigenous person gone to Geneva to be listened to pueblo y no eh, bajo la sombrilla del estado canadiense o del estado de los Estados Unidos sino que eh, de, de escaje que es el, este indígena siempre manifestó que los pueblos indígenas tienen el derecho a ser escuchados en su propia voz 100 años después esto ha cambiado poco 100 años después la disputa eh, en el plano internacional sigue siendo la misma que eh, en el caso, por ejemplo, de América Latina y el Caribe, sucede hace cinco siglos, cuando se ha intentado la imposición eh, de modelos eh, monoculturales y que se ha impuesto las fronteras eh, sobre los territorios indígenas. Have been imposed over the lands and territories of indigenous peoples. So as cultures, indigenous cultures, we are not like different imperial, imperial powers. Imperial powers, they rise, they fall, but indigenous cultures do not. Indigenous cultures resist. They transform, they maybe have to get used to certain things, but they never disappear. That's been the legacy of indigenous peoples. And from that historical perspective, when the United Nations was created in 1948, it says, all the people, this is the, this is the declaration of the UN, who make, make it up are the peoples but who are there, who are seated at the General Assembly, are the ones that who are decide what are the political priorities, what policies will give in priority, and who makes that decision? The states in the name of the peoples. And this is what we have been seeing in this period. The, I was telling you that the very name of the indigenous UN permanent form of indigenous peoples, it doesn't say, it, it says um, about indigenous issues or on indigenous issues. And that's how the governments were able to reach an agreement because the permanent forum no es un grupo de trabajo, no es una subcomisión, porque lo que los pueblos indígenas quisieron en su momento es tener un mecanismo al más alto nivel que pueda interlocutar. We have to have a different level to talk to the states one on one. And you, you to you, and this is a continual challenge that we're having to talk to the states on the same level. At the, and this is especially something that is happening and at the UN. Indigenous people still have to cam camouflage themselves as an NGO. Estamos en esta, en, en esta lucha acompañando estos procesos y el foro permanente que representamos en este momento lo que quiere hacer es empujar la lucha. And what the permanent forum wants to do right now is support in the, um, the indigenous peoples in spite of the fact that it is an independent mechanism. We've always wanted to, to maintain our independence, whose objective is to support the rights of indigenous peoples, especially their, the contents of the UN Direct Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. This would be our general point of view regarding political 
ideas. The, it said that the UN's aim right now is not to leave anyone behind and that this linear perspective of time of those who are in better economic conditions in the uh, um, developed countries and the people and peoples, people who are poor are behind as if those who are ahead are doing things better than those who are supposedly behind. I question that idea. It doesn't seem logical to me because it's not a question of the world or society having a single path and that we should all follow the footprints of those who are ahead of us because the climate crisis, the environmental crisis and the political crises, crises that we are experiencing are a product of the human development of those who are supposedly ahead of us. So if climate change in reality is a consequence of the human footprint on the planet, on water, how are we going to follow those footsteps? We need to forge a different pathway. I'm not talking about not leaving anyone behind, but we need to not let anyone left out because as some indigenous people say, we need to be seated at the table because if you're not at the table, some say it's because he's on the menu and that's important. We must, our, our, our struggle must be clear. And we've seen that in the debates that are being carried forward right now. What are the most important discussions over the last three years, we focused on the need for a global energy transition. Nevertheless, in 2022 and 2023, we have seen how the geopolitical discussions on war and peace have become central and how these global debates between peace and war in the hemisphere are manifesting themselves in a greater need to implement extractivism because the economies are, well, it's as if they were, were a sort of challenge between muscular bodies, each side It tries to be more powerful than the other. It's a challenging attitude between one economic tendency, which is the capitalist one, and another economic tendency, which is also capitalistic, to see who is stronger than the other in economic terms. And so consequently, peoples and territories are seen as backyards and extractivism instead of slowing down because of climate change has be only increased after the pandemic. And that is the situation that indigenous peoples throughout the world are facing because their territories continue to be a reservoir, an important reservoir for economic interests. And on the other hand, there are economies that are on the sidelines of public debate, but in reality, uh, they, are, they are functioning, for example, such as drug trafficking, but the pressures of drug trafficking are affecting social dynamics on the territories. So discussions or debates on climate change and geopolitics and economic modalities are affecting indigenous people's day-to-day -day life throughout the world. And why do I say that climate change debates are affecting this? 
because, for example, governments say that a way of mitigating climate change is by protecting those areas, those regions of the world that have vast biodiversity and that the adequate, the proper way to protect them is to create special figures of protection with special types of administration. Excuse me, uh, school, uh, please excuse me. I, I, I just, I'd like to stop there for a second because what you're telling us is bringing to two specific points before you get into this point and uh, because you had you had the opportunity to be present on the uh, in the COP26 on climate change and COP15 on biodiversity and i think your reflections on these two processes are very interesting and when you reiterate in reiterated fashion have talk how, how unacceptable it is to separate biodiversity and climate change. I would like you to bring together these two perspectives you have so that I could hone in on specific questions regarding uh, climate change and biodiversity, if you don't mind. Well, thank you. I think it has to do with the same thing. The indigenous peoples are not sectors as governments are configured. Governments were organized to handle on the one hand, education, health, the environment, agriculture. Indigenous peoples are not um, corporations. I'm, I'm interpreter's correction. They're not civil society. Uh, civil society uh, are, is part of modern uh, society where there is a, a distinction between the government and civil society. The peoples have their own governments. They have their only their own forms of social organizations. So um, indigenous peoples are not civil society either. They are not part of what is known as popular culture, because if popular culture has to do with this way of class struggle, which is the product of an economic perspective, which reflects a social group, which says that liberalism isn't the best way, but rather socialism and there are other ideological currents. Indigenous peoples are not a product of this ideological distribution. Indigenous peoples are peoples with their own particularities and their own worldview. So from this perspective, global discussions that are taking place now on climate change, biodiversity, cannot presuppose that the, uh, in the governments of indigenous peoples do, are not important in conserving biodiversity or that the indigenous peoples world views are not directly related to the way in which the rights of insects, trees, etc., have been preserved. Because at the end of the day, it has been proved that where cultural diversity has been recognized, there is the greatest degree of biodiversity. So you can separate the discussion between the recognition of cultural and political rights and bio, biodiversity because the two are inseparable. Furthermore, this division between culture and nature is fictitious. Uh, 
because of the Western way of things, seeing things. And the other hand, in these regions of the world where the indigenous people initially were refugees and later they became uh, territories, but or in other cases where uh, it was always the territories, for example, in the Amazon, there are many territories. I know the experience of my countries and I know that indigenous peoples have been always present on their territories. Other indigenous peoples reached certain territories as a result of displacement, but most of the indigenous peoples have always been present on the territories and their worldview have allowed them to take care of water, have to take care of rivers, take care of lakes. So you can't engage in debates on climate change as being separate from cultural and political rights of indigenous peoples. And you can't separate that from debates on biodiversity because it's all the same thing. It's the result of a way of life and not the result And I say this with great affection. It's not the result of the actions of anti-capitalist NGOs. They are important allies. But the indigenous people's way of life is what has allowed us to take care of nature and live with nature. Talk, debating climate change without taking into consideration the major players is tantamount to collective suicide because it means being unaware of the major reason why the absorption sponges for greenhouse gases that continue to exist on the planet. That's the case on one hand. And on the other hand, to think that climate change solutions has to do with protecting a specific area of the planet and not another area is a du the direct consequence this generates is fragmentation, uh, discrimination between first class indigenous peoples and second class indigenous peoples and in indigenous peoples who are conservationist oriented and non-conservation oriented individuals. And, we can't conceive of this. We need that indig all indigenous people, uh, territories be viewed um, holistically. They're all important and they need to be compensated, not for economic reasons, but because of their rights, the rights to have their own governments, the rights to have their own educational systems, the rights to have their own health care systems. It's a way of recognizing the contributions of indigenous peoples to climate struggle, not simple, not mere poetry or declarations. That what in, in, That's what indigenous peoples have always claimed, their rights and, and we've in the, and global fora, this is what we see is lacking because when you show up in one of these areas, what you see is that the same order, uh, world order is maintained where there's some enormous um, encampments or where there's a meeting room where it's uh, there's a vision here, only presidents can enter and here no Indians blacks or other people can come in they have to meet elsewhere and well from time to time you get a, a president who stops by to greet you or perhaps from time to time you might hear a declaration that everyone has to agree upon who's going to speak who's going to say something he's got three minutes or two minutes to say something and th those are the ways in which these um copes are organized We could say that big um, businesses like Coca-Cola have the ability to have 
uh, uh, to finance NGOs or other corporations have a tremendous um, um, lobbying capacity and the negotiations end up being closed circles among the same people who the same parties that generate the, the problem they are the people these parties are end up negotiating the solutions it's not very effective we could say uh, dario and dario hello dario there is an issue in the cop 15 which took place recently in montreal in december on the yeah, on biodiversity and the indigenous movement held a mobilization and some people listening today were there for this very controversial goal of 3030 where the individual indigenous uh, peoples uh, are viewed as a a, a conservation um, category they you were present in the negotiations and we could see what that countries such as Canada, New Zealand, Australia, Norway were, uh, were among the more powerful colonial states that opposed these propo proposals. How do you, why is it that what you wanted was not uh, achieved, but how can you move forward with this mobilizations to um, push forward other struggles of, of indi indigenous peoples? So, um, COP26 uh, set aside resources for indigenous peoples to um, administer the land, but only in the tropics. And now I know you're fighting to get financing for all the regions because all regions are being affected. I wish you, I would hope you could comment briefly on that. Thank you. I think that like every um, matter um, in, for indigenous peoples, nothing is a gift and everything is achieved gradually, starting from the fact that the Convention on Bio um, Biodiversity, which w was agreed upon in Rio in 1970, came about at a time when Convention 169 or the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples did not exist yet, and many peoples did not recognize Indigenous Peoples. So they came up with a concept to refer to them. They said, well, there may be Indigenous Peoples and those and those places where indigenous peoples are not recognized, let them be uh, recognized as local communities. And that's how uh, it came, was edited in the uh, Rio Convention on Biodiversity. And this became a custom, which is, become, which is becoming a standard. And countries like Colombia, they have no need to talk about local communities because in Colombia, there are indigenous peoples, Afro peoples, um, campesino peoples, fishing peoples, all social groups, all social groups have their social status recognized. Recently, the campesina, uh, statement of rights was recognized. There's no need in Colombia, but these com countries use this concept to say that local communities is not a category, but a subject. This generates problems. So when we went to the discussion of who really has political status, a recognized political status internationally, it's indigenous peoples. And so consequently, their lands belong to them and they have fulfilled the task of promoting biodiversity. What governments are saying is recognize this capacity that indigenous peoples have 
already been exercising thousands of years since thousands of years before before the Rio Convention took place. This very basic approach would seem to be one of common sense. It has not been appropriately interpreted by governments because they say, no, if we talk about indigenous territories, we would always have to talk about traditional territories for other populations, but we've always said you can't um compare to lead to a worsening of rights you can't compare um peoples to reduce indigenous people's status so this became a discussion of technical terms a discussion between the experts who are familiar with the biodiversity convention and the history of the biodiversity convention how it has managed rights language and the discussion by those of us who are lobbying for a prop proper suit of uh, integration of the declaration of rights of indigenous peoples and in the co COP 15, I saw that there were people who arrived from the territories. There were people who showed up with a great deal of hope because these are people who, who have done their homework, people who whose feet are in the mud, who live in nature. These are the experts in taking care of life on the planet. And these experts are not listened to. The people who are listened are the procedural convention experts. That was my impression. That was the impression I had at the COP. Nevertheless, an important step was taken, which uh, regards to indigenous and traditional territories. And I was very clear about saying that traditional territories need to be understood in the light of articles 20, um, uh, six and 25 of the Declaration on Indigenous Peoples' Rights because there are indigenous territories that are titled and untitled, but that are possessed traditionally, and they are also indigenous territories. It's a very important step. I think that for the case of Colombia, the interpreter, uh, Sorry, but there the signal has been cut off. Dario? The capacity of the indigenous authorities on their territory, this advance that was achieved in COP15 is a very important element, which should be used to transform the national work plans, in other words, what I'm trying to say is that with this, the regional governments committed to inform the international community on the advances being made inside their countries, but they're not going to do it unless there's pressure from indigenous peoples so that the or indigenous peoples organizations should insist that governments should transform indigenous areas. They should grant indigenous peoples autonomy resources. They should give them the capacity to be environmental authorities, and that can contribute to the biodiversity convention in annual reports. I think that's what's been gained here. What's been gained here is a new tool for um, struggling for these rights that already exist in various parts of the region, specifically in America, in the Americas. Thank you. Um, and Dario, we're running out of time. And all of your experiences and all of what you're sharing with us allow us to better understand the region. I would like to close with two questions before I open up the floor to the participants. I'm going to throw them out right now so you can answer them in five minutes. One is very important, which is 
the issue of the feminization and um, home, uh, homicides of indigenous rights de um, defenders there. This is one of the very uh, widespread in Latin America. And as you mentioned in, and also in Brazil, yes, thank you, Maria. You at the beginning of your intervention spoke about extractive in industries regarding um, the impoverishment of the territories, how regionally and nationally can advancement be made in terms of the extractive industries with respect to climate change. We're talking about autonomy and the recognition of um, indigenous rights. And there, there is the uh, Inter-American Convention on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, I, I, obviously, this is a non-binding declaration, but it's very important for the region. And we do have it in the region. How do you believe that we can advance in Latin America to give a new impulse to this declaration? I'm going to start with your second question, because I think it will allow me to answer the first one. Indeed, what I feel is, and other people, uh, uh, some um, indigenous leaders in the region have told me this, is that the indigenous rights declaration in the Americas is was very important in terms of when it was being negotiated. After it was adopted by the OAS assembly, uh, it was not discussed anymore. It was more visible when it was being negotiating, negotiated than when it was achieved. As a matter of fact, even uh, when we were aware that in some aspects, the Inter-American Declaration is more advanced than the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The main reason for that is that this is an instrument that is not part of the public agenda of the states. And since it's not part of the public agenda of the states, it was a matter as the Green, gringo say it was a checklist we did that we fulfilled that we passed that nothing is left so um, i think we got to take a leadership role to work on the implementation of the declaration that's why the permanent forum in its 20th session recommended to the OAS that it create a joint dialogue mechanism between indigenous peoples and states to identify actions and develop strategies to progressively implement the America's Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. But this recommendation, if there's nobody um, to sponsor it, it will just be one more uh, uh, declaration. So, um, um, so in the last um, assembly in Peru, we were speaking with various governments and we achieved uh, this. This became a OAS task to organize regional uh, meetings to see what this mechanism could be that would drive forward the implementation of the American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We're close to having the, the next OAS meeting. Um, and I see this isn't on part of the agenda, Indigenous agenda of the meeting. And I'm very sorry to say that, but it is my great hope that it will become once again an an important matter and indigenous organizations will demand of their governments uh, to say, Chile, we need you to finance a regional meeting of indigenous uh, meetings uh, or Brazil or Colombia 
or Mexico, any of these governments that can take leadership because regional meetings are expensive. But uh, many, there's a lot of investment, many things, and this is fundamental. And and the states in their political pero quizás esta sea una manera de fortalecerse que es escuchando a los pueblos indígenas a way to strengthen indigenous peoples and i think that we also have to include the answers to the first question indeed the issues with security for indigenous peoples should be part of the regional public agenda. It can't be said that if one of the regions that's supposed to be the most one of the most democratic and environmentally conscious is where there's the greatest amount of homicide, uh, murder, persecution of indigenous leaders, there has been the violation of rights, the murder of indigenous women. It's not that it's something worse, but it has a fundamental impact on the culture and the traditional knowledge systems of indigenous peoples. The fact that violence exists against indigenous peoples, men and women, that keeps recurring, this is an important issue to consider because it's based on extractivism because many times the armed actors uh, that say that they're defending the popular people they say that they do not they see indigenous peoples as enemies or en allies of their enemies but rally but really it's it's a struggle to conserve biodiversity and life on the planet so we need to have regional dialogues I do think that as indigenous peoples, if we have a mechanism for regional dialogues, we could be involved more in the international scenarios like the anti-drug policies or policies that have to do with conservation in the Amazon or Mesoamerica or the Pacific. As indigenous peoples, we do have the capacity to to contribute solutions. But if we don't have this type of mechanism, it's going to be difficult because the struggle will always be something internal. And clearly the issues, as I said in the beginning, the geostrategic issues affect the daily life of indigenous peoples. And this includes the entire region. So I do believe that the criminalization of indigenous peoples and political violence should really be on the first order of business in the political agenda, public political agenda. And it should also be on the regional dialogue and as indigenous peoples and their allies, they should look for a way to be more interconnected as the way we used to do these Abaya Yala summits, these big meetings of indigenous peoples of the North, Central and South America, we need to continue to do this and to strengthen them. Because on the contrary, if we do not, we will not be visible as a political force in the region, but rather as small groups in each of the countries. So I'll stop there. Thank you. These are just my desires. Thank you. Thank you, Dario. It's been fascinating to listen to your reflections and also to have a global perspective what's going on. Um, I know some of the questions that will people will ask me will be also about the region and locally. Maybe some of you will ask questions to um, center on some of these uh, si different situations. So now I'd like to, we have 25, a session of 25 minutes for questions. So it's very important for us to listen to you. Um, 
that are in the territories. So we now give you the floor. Vital, Vital Bambanse, he's a member of the Permanent Forum also, and he is connected. Vital, do you want to say hello? He's ca calling from Burundi. He's a great colleague uh, of Dario. Um, hi, Louisa. Hi, the team. Um, good afternoon. I mean, it is a good evening because in Burundi now we are six o'clock. Um, I was very happy to attend this session, which was very interesting. I thank Dario for the presentations and uh, the scenarios that indigenous peoples are living in uh, Latin America. And uh, we are also happy with what you are achieving as indigenous peoples. Um, my name is uh, Vital Bambas. I think you took your mic, isn't it, for interpretation? Um, my name is Vital Bambansi. I'm a member of the UN Permanent Forum from Burundi, nominated by the states. Um, working with indigenous organization in Burundi and indigenous peoples are the battle in my country. Um, they are linked to hunter gatherers in Central Africa, and uh, we are working in a networking with uh, other indigenous peoples organization. Uh, then I'm a member of the uh, Indigenous of Africa Coordinating Committee, which is a, a umbrella organization. And uh, also uh, we have some links with the African Commission on Human People's Rights because my organization has status of observer. Um, I'm not going to take you much time because uh, I know that uh, most of participants want to take the floor, uh, but I was, um, I was saying that uh, before going to school, we didn't realize that we are different from other children or groups, but we were put aside and the people were saying that indigenous children are smiling, so we will refuse to sit with other children and uh, also will refuse to eat with uh, others and sometimes it refuses to drink water with other children. So we began to understand that we are different from other children. After we went to school, uh, we succeeded, which was uh, positive. And when we finished our studies, we were very few because of marginalization and the discrimination. Most of uh, indigenous ch children drop out the studies and we were few, for example, to go to university. And we were told, no, we are not indigenous peoples because it was known like uh, indigenous peoples do not have enough capacity to to finish or to complete high scores and then go to university. So we learned that it is our um, obligation to create organization and to defend the rights of indigenous peoples. And that is why, for example, in Burundi, there is a recognition of participation of indigenous peoples in the National Assembly with the three seats and the uh, three seats in the Senate. And uh, also now we have a Minister of uh, Human Rights from our group. So uh, we are very thankful because the new government now is promoting and recognizes that we are existing as citizen 100%. I thank you for giving me this floor and I was very happy uh, to follow and then I will be happy to continue to hear from other participants. Thank you, Luisa. No, thank you so much, Vital. And we are gonna we are happy to report that on March 16, we have a dialogue dedicated on Africa and Vital Van Basen and, and Hindu Omaru are connecting. So we hope you also can, can join. So thank you, Vital. We are gonna open the floor for the questions and thank you so much for your insights.
I'm, I'm sorry, I cannot hear you. Let me check if it is not a problem. Oh. Ah, it was the interpretation, but it's okay, Vita. We're gonna go, uh, we're gonna hold with the questions. Okay, you study, the floor is yours. All right, so I, I pinned Benito, who was the first person to raise their hand. So uh, Benito Calisto, please, uh, you have the floor. Gracias. Bueno, eh, saludar. Thank you. I want to say hello to everyone that's participating here in this conversation. I want to express my recognition and greet my brother, Darío Mejía, my brother in the resistance and the struggle, because he is part of our organization. My name is Benito Calixto Guzman. I am the general coordinator of the Andean organization of indigenous peoples Kaoi. Listening to Darío, I still find, I see some frustrations when we participate at the permanent forum. When we participate at this global space in this space that's been created within the state of the systems and the UN system, there are still some aspiration that indigenous peoples have, especially so that in the rights of indigenous peoples and human rights be respected, the right to health, education, self-determination. But anyway, I'd like to ask Darío, now that he is the chair of the permanent forum, what does he think? What does he feel? Finding a system that is now a system that is not listening to it, it falls on deaf ears. The the needs that we have as indigenous peace peoples, and especially how to go advancing in the implementation of recognition on the rights of indigenous peoples. in our territories, in our worldview of territory, it's not just the soil, but it's also the subsoil, it's the air, and all the natural resources. And everything that is trying to be controlled by the state. So I'd like to know if Dadio can share with us some reflections on how to advance in the implementation of our rights. And the other is about the participation of indigenous peoples in different diverse uh, global scenarios on climate change and the famous COPs. What advances or what setbacks have we had as indigenous peoples also at the CBD? And then also this UN Water Conference where indigenous peoples, we have reivindicated these spaces. Nobody has gifted us anything. It's really a process of struggle. We have gained participation in these spaces. So I'd like to know from Darío, what's the balance that we have of participation of indigenous peoples? And my recognition to the fruitful work that Darío Mejía has been doing. I desire him great success and the um, now the role that you have to play. Thank you, Benito. Uh, Darío, you now have the floor. Would you like to answer? Thank you very much. And I want to send a very special greeting to our colleague and our brother Vital Bambanse. And I saw that he was connected and I listened to him briefly. And also a very special greeting to Benito from the coordinator of the and and indigenous peoples. And I thank you all for your kind words. I'd like to start um, at the final comment. Um, at the last session of the permanent forum, even though it is not part of the forum's agenda, but during the session on the 20th of April, we will have a hearing with the presidency of the General Assembly, a meeting to have with the General Assembly to take up this discussion again 
on the participation of indigenous peoples at the UN, because as we well know, the permanent forum is as an um, expert mechanism group. We are not part of the UN staff. We act as in as independent experts. But our principal role is to drive forward the implement adequate implementation of the rights of indigenous peoples. And one of those rights is participation, in, uh, relevant participation. Uh, the connection has been lost. Sorry, the interpreter regrets, but the in connection has been lost. Darío, are you there? I'm sorry, the interpreter. The connection has been cut off. Well, well, Darío connects once again. I'd like to remember that there are several leaders of the region like Benito, Juan Leon, and others that have, have been working on these issues very with so much effort and energy. And they are working on these issues in order. Um, they're, we're going to have this big meeting after 47 years, and even it's not a conference that will maybe not have uh, commitments from the states. However, we are going to be the continue to champion that we be included and to include our narratives. Oh, there, there's uh, Darío again. We lost you for a little bit. I was just telling them a little bit about the conference of water and Benito and Juan Leon, that other companions from the region. If you want to continue, go ahead. Sorry about that. We are going to have this interactive dialogue with the General Assembly with the rights of participation. And this is something that we have um, a task as the members of the permanent forum. We already did, started this in Geneva at the UN in the concept of human rights for the first time. There has been a consensus in recognizing that indigenous peoples are not NGOs, nor are we civil society. The next step is that they recognize, have a different status as indigenous peoples. And that's not enough to be uh, observers, to have that kind of status. We've been recognized for many, a long trajectory, and we need to retake up, we need to take up this topic again in New York, and we'll see what fruits are produced. And I, I hope that the indigenous leaders will be there and we can advocate in a very strong way in order to take up this discussion again so that governments can name the facilitators for this debate and this discussion. I have asked, for example, as some governments that parallel and at the same time, we can initiate the inclusion of indigenous peoples in the modalities of convening different meetings. That's what Luisa was explaining just now that in spite of the fact that the convening for the UN Water Conference, indigenous peoples are not included, that we have all, always, we have done work to use the UN Permanent Forum Secretariat and other platforms in order to give access to indigenous peoples to that permanent forum. Something is something. We were wishing it could be better to have better spaces for debate in the interactive dialogues. 
en algunos okay. eh, eh, but we will have the possibility to dialogue and also to, we will have a pre-summit for uh, indigenous peoples and we are hoping próximas resoluciones puedan incluir pueblos indígenas uh, resolutions will include indigenous peoples. Now I'd like to give the floor to Rocio. Can you please keep your question brief? Thank you. Rocio? Rocio, you now have the floor. Oh, yes, she activated her microphone. Daniel, could you answer, ask your question? We don't hear Rocio. Um, yes, of course. Do you hear me? Yes. I wanted to thank you once again and thank Dario for the conversation. The first one has to do with Thelec, and we were given a observer, permanent verb observer status, and this allowed for indigenous participation at the UN. And but I really think that it's not enough. And I've also heard about the importance of talking about having a seat at the General Assembly. But how could this indigenous peoples? How would they coordinate? Who would have that seat? And then would it be by percentage of Latin America? Who's been in the struggle? And how would that be coordinated? That's one question that I would have. Dario? Let's see if my connectivity works. I think that all the progress that we can make is important. We know that uh, FELAC is made up of governments as well as indigenous people's organization. And be, since it does have permanent observer status at the UN, this means that it, we have a voice of support in different discussions. And we also always need to increase the direct particip participation of indigenous peoples. And about the next the next point that he asked, I think that indigenous peoples, organizations, we need to work on that internally. The discussion really centers around what is the criteria? What is the cr criteria that you will keep in mind? The status that we look for is as indigenous peoples. And there are as indigenous peoples, they feel that they are representative and others that um, think they're represented by their organizations. But I can't really discuss, make, talk about those things because as indigenous peoples, they will have to dis make, have those discussions autonomously and make and come to those decisions on their own. But as I mentioned in Geneva, there's a very important, um, a very important saying that we have and it's like you can't saddle the beast before you write it and so we first have to have the status so you can't put the cart before the horse really so we can't waste our time on internal discussions when we don't still don't have the status uh, assured so we have to do it little by little thank you now abdu you have the floor abdu Maybe could you have a real, a specific question and to the point? Abdu, you have the yes. floor. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Dario, for sharing those insights. I definitely recommend you as well as your team for the wonderful job you're doing to ensure that, ensure that indigenous people's rights are definitely respected and preserved at all costs. So in context, actually, I am a digital inclusion intern with the International Telecommunications Union. So my question would be, um, what measures are you guys taking to ensure that indigenous peoples are um, actually included in this digital age?
Darío. Tal vez Darío está escuchando la interpretación. Sí, se escuchó. Listo, Darío, adelante. Yes, uh, I heard the interpretation. Gracias. Thank you. Well, to remember that the permanent forum is a, a mechanism that gives recommendations to the states, the governments, and to the UN agencies. And this mandate that we have is to recommend to the private sector as well as to the state governments that they, when they have these transformation of the political policies on the digital age, that they can really include indigenous peoples and in, including if they're not really related to the infrastructure of interconnectivity, but also with public services. We need to have more translations to, um, for example, the legal standards can be translated into, um, for example, the recommendation 39 for the rights of indigenous women and children. It's not just to have access to the infrastructure, but also that society also gets to know the rights of indigenous peoples, uh, the rights of indigenous peoples in political policies because we need to work on this so that there be translations into indigenous languages and other languages. We need to really work on the media matrix and to stop the discrimination against indigenous peoples. This has been the way that we have taken up this discussion and the recommendations. Rocio, if you want to start, activate your microphone and share your concrete question. I'm going to read the question of Rocio. I think that it's very important to consider what's been going on in the setbacks. I'm sorry, she's reading very fast, uh, such as um, dividing the territory, preventing the exercise of autonomy. My question is related to the risk of traditional knowledge when incorporating it to com commercialization scheme and access contracts as mentioned in the Goya protocol. How can there be fair relations with asymmetrical, asymmetrical relations when companies and peoples and communities negotiate? I'm going to try to answer that question because There is a debate on recognizing the territories of indigenous peoples. The panel of experts spoke on this and everyone for the first time has recognized that the uh, knowledge of indigenous peoples does not have to be validated by science or by those um, ideas that have to do with scientific validation. This is just a declarative sense, but then the instruments for procedure on intellectual property, for example, um, this at the end of this month, WIPO in France will meet um, the World Intellectual Property Organization, will gather together, and other protocols like on Nagoya, where we still do not have a, a clear understanding on the place of indigenous peoples. So this really means a huge risk because there are really in institutional disadvantages. We can't ignore that legal discussions have to be accompanied by at institutional um, putting, adequating these institu 
institutions and there is has been a lot of co-opting of indigenous in indigenous knowledge for example in the pharmaceutical industry we have had impact on uh, fashion different like lispy to they are expropriating indigenous people's knowledge like maasai people in africa and different parts of the world so it's really important that indigenous organizations and our allies we keep we have to keep this at the middle of the discussion catherine hortensia and yuri catherine if you could go straight to your question yes thank you for such an important event that you organize i am kichwa Mianakwanti. she is greeting her language it is my maternal language in Quechua. I'm from the southern part of Peru. And my question, and in some way, my comment is related to what it, it is known in the academic discourse and also contemporarily, as we know, as the indigenization, indigenous, as Darío mentioned, we shouldn't consider it just as another sector. But I would like to ask in relation to indigenous peoples, especially the Quechua and Aymara people, unfortunately, we have seen in the last months from uh, starting in December in Peru that due to the conflict and the crisis, political, social crisis that's taken place that's caused more than 60 deaths. And we would say that it's really a massacre. And in fact, we have not that notice that these these really have uh, taken place from the Quechua and the Aymara people from the south, southern part of Peru. How is it, Darío, do you consider that this analysis, this critical analysis, should also include in the Indian context where Peru seems to be like an island in comparison to the mobilization of indigenous peoples like of Bolivia. And legally speaking, we have in Bolivia and Ecuador, they have different approaches to this in 2008 and 2010 that does not happen in Peru. We don't have these indigenous agency. And I see that in other, other countries in Latin America, maybe it's like in the Amazonian indigenous peoples, but not from the Quechua and Aymara. Um, so we've seen in the Peruvian contest, we've seen this failure of the centralization, centralization of political ec economic and social access. So indigenous peoples have really been become exhausted in our struggle. I know that we don't really have solutions um, to these very complex situations, but what's our task as indigenous peoples, as indigenous peoples that we have seen that throughout history, there has been a centralization, but also I think that, that it has also been very harmful historically and also contempor contemporaneously. How do you see this critical analysis that it's been very nationalist uh, idea of the Peruvian case and that's centralized these political and social economic access. How can we become more mobile, uh, mobilize ourselves? Um, how can we face these challenges? Darío, can you answer this? Thank you very much for this, that complex question. I think there's two things. This has been very common in a history in 
Latin America, the discrimination, extermination, marginalization of indigenous peoples, but especially in Peru, it there has been a greater level of of indescribable uh, fragmentation that this has caused in the extreme level, especially in, per in Peru. Indigenous peoples have not been recognized in Peru and how the political class historically has treated the indigenous and and Dian indigenous peoples. It really, I can't even, it's so terrible. I can't even give it a name, but Benito, Benito is from Peru. We, we really have to take into account these histories that's really um, undescribable and very painful. But we can also see that the, he, the geographic, hemispherical, political policies that affect different um, governments in the region. So Colombia, Chile, Brazil, in some cases, Mexico, they are winning what we would call progressive tendencies. And in Peru, I think there's also been a, an important step, even though there has been errors that have been made because there was a president that did belong to the dominant historical um, party. So even though this is happening, we can't lose sight of the fact that there is a bigger geopolitical issue going on. There is a confrontation between the global economies and regional economies. But I insist that these are topics that we really need to dedicate more, uh, discuss internally with the in, our brothers from Peru, but really we are with them in solidarity and to have regional dialogue in order to support the reality of indigenous peoples in Peru. Thank you. Hortensia. Hortensia. Hello, Hortensia Dilar Hidalgo. I'm Aymara from the indigenous peoples, the northern part of Chile. Thank you for this discussion. Thank you, Darío. It has been a panorama of the real situation that we as indigenous peoples are living, and especially as indigenous women. In my case, I am a cattle owner and a farmer. And when we talk about climate change and now with the UN Water Conference, as many of you know, last year in my community, we all lost, unfortunately, the effort that we had made to planting because we we didn't have um, the fruits of our labor because we don't have enough water. We are in that terrible situation where we're having a drought and they make us become more impoverished because we no longer have our food due to the droughts. But also it's a product of the freezing that takes place early on in the season that shouldn't be happening. So in our traditional knowledge, and especially as women, we are the ones that that are in charge of these different situations. So we are doubly affected because we are the ones that are in charge of like providing food to our families. And so in our communities, in my communities there, and in many communities throughout Latin America, we don't have water. And the water that we have to drink, we share it with our animals. The, these are also our, our younger brothers and sisters. We consider them as such. So there are big funds that are given, but as indigenous peoples, we do not see them and they will never reach our indigenous communities that are so far away. And, and on the other hand, the permanent forum is so important and relevant. Have we, we have advanced 
but we want them to not just be recommendation and stay there on the paper, piece of paper, but the states should affirm them and confirm them into processes within our important processes within our countries. And we have to be struggle. They have to struggle so they're not just recommendations, one after another, one after another. Yudi, briefly. Thank you so much, Yudi. Thank you so much for being here and Darío for the work that you're my name is Yuri Alexander. I'm studying a master's degree at the university. And before I worked at the Inter-American Commission and I'm Afro-Colombian. My question has to do with your comment on the Inter-American Convention on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And my impression was this the implementation of said declaration could have positive effects, but it's a declaration, not a convention. And I'd like to know why do you think, what could be the way to transform this declaration into something stronger to be implemented? It's a, not a binding declaration as a convention would be because we have that idea that could this be done, that the st could the states commit themselves to carry the, out this implementation? Roy, briefly, so that Dario, we're almost done with um, the interpreters have to leave and Dario also has to be leaving. Roy, you have the floor. Roy, Roy, you have the floor. Darío, can you close with these two or three questions and to close the event? Thank you, Darío. No, thank you so much. And I, what my sister said, I really have no comment on that. I do agree that the, the situation of indigenous women is very serious and it's getting worse and it really exacerbates their vulnerabilities in, especially when faced with these current changes of climate change. And the, um, in relation to the other question, we have to remember that from the beginning, it's really the struggle for the recognition of indigenous peoples for biodiversity. And it doesn't matter if it's a convention or a declaration. It is a political achievement. It's better to have a declar declarative um, instrument that's political instead of not having it. I'm sorry, his connection is not very good. The interpreter regrets it, but the connection is cutting in and out. It doesn't matter what the nature of the instrument is. We also always want to have an advancement of the recognition of our rights in order to transform the political, national, and international policies. and instruments therefore the formalities his connection is cutting in and out it's unstable we lost Darío. Luce, i wanted to talk about what you mentioned as indigenous women what the work that has been done with juan leon and benito the people that are here connected I don't know if Benito is here, but Benito, do you want to talk about the participation of women? We'd be happy to give you the floor just for a few minutes because I don't know if Darío can. Yes, of course, just briefly, just to share with you, share with you just a slice of what's happening in Kaoi. We are an equal footing in 60%. Yeah. 
we share the leadership with women. And I think the participation of women is very important. And we've mentioned on several occasions, they are great um, traditional knowledge holders and of ancestral knowledge. And they have to be there in all the spaces of decision making, not just being with the men, but also to have an effective participation in all the political decision making. And they have to be included in the national, local leadership. In the Peruvian case, we have not had these advances because we are trying to modify the law of campesino and communities. There's more than 6,000 campesino commun organizations, and we have to integrate that um, way of thinking of being on equal footing. Thank you, Benito. I don't know, Juan Leon, are you still here with us? Juan, would you be able to share a couple words about women and how they participated? Yes. Could you share this with us? Yes, Luisa, thank you so much. And hello to everyone and to our brother Dario Mejia. Thank you for calling for this meeting and briefly, the participation of women and indigenous women especially is, at, is growing at all levels, especially from the local level, the national level and international level especially in Guatemala, in Guatemala, many of indigenous women are taking the lead in, organ, as in organizations and ancestral leadership and organization. And International Indian Treaty Council is uh, carrying out a consultation with Latin America. And tomorrow we're going to have one of these consultations and with great participation of women from Mexico, Nicaragua, Panama, and Colombia and other countries, they are all involved. So I encourage all of our sisters that they really need to make these qualitative leaps in knowledge and in various fora. We have mentioned, we can say that it is really the woman in all, her, in all senses, in all areas, she is the one that transmits, that maintains, and that makes effective the, the practical inheritance of scientific knowledge at all levels of indigenous peoples. It has to do with cell, with health, medicine. They are the knowledge holders. And on food sovereignty and agriculture and the care for, for the animals, the medicinal plants, and such. So I really encourage all of you, um, all your sisters to really participate in these and take control of the spaces. Maybe Juan, you can share the, inter uh, the Latin America consultation for the UN Water Conference. Maybe could you put that in the chat and we'll share that with everyone. Yes, I'll do that. So Dario, do you wanna close off? And we want to thank you very much for taking the time to be with us and to share with us all this reflections. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Luisa. Thank you for calling for this meeting and for this invitation. And thank you to all the participants. I heard Juan and there's a bunch of people here that uh, very illustrious, important people that are working uh, that are working on the indigenous movement at the regional territorial levels. And I'm so sorry, I didn't have the best of um, connection. And But anyway, we did everything that we could and thank you for the effort that everyone made. And I want to thank all of you. And I think that these spaces that we share here are really seeds that we are planting to really have a flowering of bigger dialogues and transformations at the organizational level, at the regional level, and the national level. We're hoping to have greater conversation, greater discourse. And only through collective work can we really drive forward what we can do 
uh, when we are at a distance. So I really encourage all of you to continue to be continue to continue to be active in these dialogues and to participate in these global and regional dialogues and always to cont contribute your, with your authorities and your uh, own governance and your all your people to continue to participate. Thank you, Dario. It's been such an honor to have you here and at this McGill University. And I want to thank so much uh, Rebecca Knight and Daniel Scher for the great interpretation. And this will help us to reach many other people. And thank you so much and it will include many other regions. I saw in the chat that more than 22 people from Mexico, Guatemala, Kenya, Guatemala, Peru, in Argentina, Cabon, Switzerland. Thank you so much, all of you. We wait for you. We're gonna do on the 16th of March for the African region. We're gonna have another session and Vital Bambanse will be here. He's from the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues and also Hindu Omaru. She's a great activist from the African region. Thank you so much. I hope that this you really enjoyed this and that you found this very interesting. And we count on you for the, our next dialogues. Thank you so much.